uh, it was certainly a big time for the city, um, and a lot of very interesting things were happening. Uh, and especially kind of coming off the end of uh, the freeway uh, project being canceled, um, this was uh, a time of a lot of big questions for Vancouver. Okay, so our first milestone is very much related to that. In 1972, the province designating Chinatown and Gastown as heritage areas, which continued to uh, halt any kind of development that would have changed that area. And ever since the zoning has remained the same and there has been kind of a constant character about these areas, uh, which is kind of shown in the pictures, there were some urban design elements put into place to uh, give these areas kind of the historic flavor that people know them for today. And it influenced the way that development happened around the area since it was kind of off limits to change this. So, um, And our next milestone is also 1973 when the province passed the Land Commission Act, which created the Agricultural Land Reserve. Uh, in the map there, you can see uh, where the original boundaries were for the entire province of British Columbia, and uh, then shown uh, what today's borders are just in our area. This act designated valuable agricultural land as protected and saw the value in this uh, pretty scarce resource that we have in this area. Today, it has a very large impact because the agricultural land reserve has become such a large part of the green zones surrounding our region that restrict urban growth from spreading too far. Um, and then also in 1973, uh, we have Arthur Erickson's design for Robson Square, which really um, had a large impact on the way that the downtown uh, is today. There were three vacant lots available in downtown, or three vacant blocks, uh, and they were meant to hold a new courthouse and, and uh, government offices. And the NDP had just come into power, and they were looking for something kind of at a different scale than the tower development. So they were interested in Erickson's proposal here uh, to have in the middle a sunken building with a uh, public space on top. And the lasting impact has really been seen as uh, towers have kind of grown up around the site and it remains kind of at a different scale than the rest of our downtown. Um, then we have in 1974 the official development plan for False Creek. And this was a really important milestone because it set out the land uses around False Creek and um, came up with new policies and design regulations around housing and also the treatment of public spaces around this formal uh, industrial site. Uh, the housing uh, is very interesting because a progressive mix was kind of set up to accommodate a large percentage of uh, more affordable housing and also it set up the idea of neighborhood enclaves instead of just uh, regular development. Also policies along the waterfront uh, created this as public space and also improve the quality of the water in the creek itself. So uh, when Ray Spaxman came in as uh, the new planning director uh, after the team election, he uh, proposed a new uh, permit process and integral to this new permit process was the development permit board. Uh, he used, the, uh, the council approved the development permit board to, be rep uh, to replace the technical planning board. And basically it was, uh, the most integral po component of the new pro process because it had the powers to reject permits based on guidelines as sourced uh, from the official development plans, um, which were also introduced during this time and which will also be a milestone of their own. Uh, so when we talked to Ray Spaxman, he emphasized that di discretionary planning, um, it's negotiation and creativity, uh, as opposed to regulatory or regular uniform equality of land use development. So each parcel of land must be considered relative to uh, its immediate surroundings. The task of planners with this kind of power is one of balance, and to have enough it's you know to have enough power to to optimize good land use, but also not to be autocratic. Uh, today, Spaxman's planning process remains relatively intact, though it has additional bargaining powers like uh, the community amenity contributions and uh, development cost levies. So yeah, um, in conjunction with that, the official development plans also were introduced. Uh, interestingly, um, Spaxman told us that um, ODPs were introduced uh, by his team of planners after doing some interpretive kind of uh, uh, research of, uh, in the Vancouver Charter. 
during the uh, planning process of False Creek, and they wanted to explore potential authority and legitimate powers that the charter could afford them. And when they discovered this, they first implemented it in the downtown official development plan. And uh, basically, an ODP allows for, instead of allowing developers to build only to the bare minimum mandated, mandated by regulatory zoning, uh, they distinguish between regulations and interpretive requirements. Uh, so interpretive requirements are things like building heights, public design, uh, as well as so public ground design, as well as social and recreational amenities and facilities. So these interpretive requirements are contained in separate documents called neighborhood guidelines, but the ODP sources them um, within its, its uh, bylaw. So ODPs today are integral for design-sensitive discretion, discretionary planning that Vancouver is famous for. Uh, for land use, they allow for pragma pragmatism and accommodation at the same time while also maintaining a respect for neighborhood uh, uh, neighborhoodliness in terms of the effects of it on the downtown. The downtown ODP helped pivot land use from an emphasis on office use to uh, mixed use of living, work, and, re and uh, recreation. So uh, kind of jumping scales to the region uh, and regional planning, which is my main interest in this project. Um, the Liverpool Region Plan came out in 1975. Um, and it was the product of a, a kind of a new generation of planners who were interested in participatory planning and public engagement instead of this traditional top-down expert planning, um, you know, using, using math, mathematical models and all of that. There was still a fair bit of expert planning in this process, but it really was informed by a ask questions first approach and then plan. Um, so uh, some of the, the key features to this uh, there were really six main recommendations, but what I thought was really central to what made this uh, impactful was that it envisioned a, a system of regional town centers, uh, particularly in uh, downtown Vancouver, um, Metro Town, New Westminster, and uh, Guilford, Ovalle, and uh, uh, Coquitlam. Um, and these town centers would be connected with a transit-oriented transportation system uh, to connect them, later known as the uh, SkyTrain system. So uh, this really guided uh, the um, future uh, development of these town centers and particularly the downtown mega projects that, uh, that uh, Anderson talked about. Um, and also his uh, public participation processes, uh, particularly uh, his six-sided triangle, which basically uh, conceptualized uh, a relationship between policymakers and politicians, bureaucrats and the public. Um, Any time there's a breakdown in communication between any of these uh, players, these actors, um, there was some sort of problem with the planning process and plans uh, got, got held up. So uh, that was something that uh, really influenced Ray Spaxman in his Vancouver planning um, and, uh, and I think that that uh, makes this a, a very important milestone. Uh, also, uh, yeah, this is just kind of from the, the plan. Uh, the kinds of, of trips that people would take between the town centers. The idea was that if you lived in a suburban neighborhood, and the Liverpool Region Plan actually said we want to keep suburban urban form, uh, you would just go to your nearest town center for most things, and then if you had a meeting in downtown, you would take the Sky Train, and then you'd come back, uh, and, and so so forth. <coughs> Uh, the Habitat Forum in 76, uh, this is uh, one of the first public forums uh, that was kind of very citizen-led, very much about planning from below, um, where people were talking about some of the issues that were afflicting them uh, in, in uh, Vancouver uh, as it became um, more and more uh, an unaffordable city. Um, it was a citizen-led component to the UN event, uh, uh, the Habitat Forum, um, uh, but it... Uh, it was very radical uh, in its conception. Um, we had uh, people who were part of the squatters' rights movement in Vancouver, uh, along with social justice, uh, Marxist uh, economists uh, from the UN coming together, planning this event, and what they produced from this was a uh, social forum where citizens got together and uh, created this um, Vancouver Declaration on um, condemning the unchecked private ownership of land and the imperative of societies to provide decent dwellings for, uh, for everyone. Um, and then the actual site uh, of the People's Forum was uh, in uh, Kitsilano on the beach. 
uh, at a uh, former uh, military base, and they used uh, air airplane hangars uh, like this one, which they repurposed uh, to make into uh, convention spaces. Um, and uh, some of the other structures that they built on the site actually used uh, heritage techniques, uh, building uh, out of uh, nothing but wood with no nails. Uh, and these were techniques that had been used in Vancouver previously that uh, artisans wanted to preserve and promote through the event. So a really wonderful um, way of seeing planning from a different perspective. Uh, but back to um, traditional so, plan. Yeah, <laughs> so our, our next one is the, uh, the redevelopment plan for Granville Island, which was approved in 1978. Uh, and this was the conversion of uh, an old industrial site along False Creek. So some of the uses had already been set up in the earlier False Creek document. Uh, it's really a model of having an interesting mix of uses, uh, including arts, um, industry, and also public marketplace, which is kind of seen on the edge of that drawing. Another thing um, that's in that drawing shows how the streets were not kind of separated in the normal fashion. And uh, there, was, there was really no like, segregation between uh, car spaces and people spaces which uh, was an interesting model that was able to use uh, successfully in that place. And it's been a lasting milestone in that it's become a very iconic cultural uh, place and an amenity for the whole city. Um, and kind of uh, looking back at, at False Creek and, uh, and some of these new developments that were coming up, uh, this document, uh, which uh, Anne McAfee talked about uh, during her presentation, uh, looked at uh, how we can think about using density and using design to make uh, densification in the, in the town centers work for families as well as for singles. Uh, and so taking some kind of Jane Jacobs inspired uh, observations about uh, human behavior uh, and, and um, uh, surveillable spaces and defensible spaces, um, uh, the city came up with these guidelines um, which uh, basically uh, try to address some of these concerns that families had and how to uh, successfully produce uh, sp uh, pr public and private spaces uh, that work for families and that would encourage families to come back to the city. And what you see uh, in the current uh, configuration of Vancouver is this tower and podium design, which kind of grew out of the South Falls Creek development, which was basically the podium, and then you just stick a tower on top of that and you get the singles living there as well. Um, so really uh, inclusive design um, was a, a really important part of False Creek and these guidelines. Uh, likewise, this inclusive zoning uh, uh, that was uh, kind of conceptualized for False Creek um, was also uh, made into a policy for the city uh, based on the fact that 30% uh, of Vancouverites in 1979 were living in either unaffordable or substandard conditions. And substandard was about a third and two thirds of that was uh, people who were paying more than 30% of their uh, income on rent. Um, so the solutions that they came up with, uh, some of them were just asking the federal and provincial money to pitch in a fair share, uh, but others have uh, had a more lasting impact in the city of Vancouver as we haven't seen that happen in recent years, such as allowing bonus density in exchange for social housing. And that has been a really important policy that the, the city has, has maintained and aspired to uh, in recent years. Uh, that would be to say, we'll let you build extra floors if you'll you know, contribute in cash uh, in lieu or uh, incorporate a certain portion of the, the units in this building as social housing. Um, and it also defined the social housing as a regional issue, which uh, Vancouver would pay, pay, play a fair share to address. And so that is also kind of embedding this um, social housing policy into a potential future partnership with the Greater Vancouver Regional District. Of course, that didn't happen because in 1983, province uh, ends regional plan um, in the uh, conservative backlash uh, after this radical period. Um, previous plans continued to guide uh, local planning, but they weren't binding. So the regional town centers kind of proliferated, um, uh, development spilled outside of the town centers and started to sprawl out and create uh, some of the, the office parks and sprawl uh, strip mall development that you see in some of the um, the uh, outlying communities outside of Vancouver. Um, and uh, the previous plans were, that had been uh, uh, formally adopted were avoided and uh, 
the GBD also lost their transportation planning authorities, and there were some conflicts over how to proceed with the, uh, the light rail transit that became the SkyTrain, whether it should be an ALRT, an automated light trail, uh, like rapid transit, uh, or a conventional uh, form, which would have been cheaper, more well-tested, um, and, uh, and, uh, and, and proven technology. Uh, and so that was another one of these conflicts that was uh, part of this decision to take all of that decision-making power out of the region and devolve it to uh, the municipalities in some cases, and in other cases, uh, uh, bring it to the provincial level and uh, put it in the hands of uh, groups that were appointed uh, by uh, the Socred so government. Okay, so in this year, this the Heritage Advisory Committee was uh, successfully lobbied the city of Vancouver to implement a heritage conservation program. Uh, the program provided an inventory of heritage resources and registered sites, as well as the development of a management plan. Uh, awards and statuses were, uh, recognized, uh, were implemented, as well as an inventory list of uh, the city's heritage sites. Um, the city also mandated that any alteration or demolishment of a designated heritage, heritage building now required a permit, giving the city some time to negotiate with homeowners or developers um, by giving them positive incentives. In 1986, the council would later adopt a new development permit guideline as well as a separate approval process in order to fur further enhance this ongoing process of retainment. Um, uh, heritage designation was always recognized as um, you know, the owner's choice, but the city gave a lot of zoning relaxations and incentives for the protection and restoration of heritage sites. Uh, by 1986, the Vancouver Heritage Register was adopted by the council, and it listed 2,200 uh, heritage sites. At that time, around 40 of these sites would be demolished per year, but uh, by eight, 1988, that number was reduced to 20, and then it has re uh, stayed below, well below that number ever since. Okay, so uh, so in the uh, original SkyTrain system that we that opened up was an answer to the victory against envisioned freeway penetration uh, in the downtown core. But at the time, the city's bus uh, system was already you know, overwhelmed, so uh, there's something else was needed. Now, apart from the automated aspect of this, which uh, Ian was talking about, apart from that. Uh, this system was actually uh, actually bore quite a semblance to the livable region plan proposals um, for the GBRD's management of growth. Uh, in 1981, the SkyTrain Rapid uh, Transit System was purchased at a discounted price, um, and the project was funded by the provincial government. And the name was also inspired by an already um, established um, uh, system, the C Bus. So that's why it's called the SkyTrain. Uh, and the original line opened in December 1985, and it would become the first automated light rail, uh, light rapid transit or light rail transit system in the world. Uh, th its impact would be basically a general adherence to elevated track lines for future lines in general, uh, and the increasing value of land adjacent to the stations, as well, more importantly, uh, it would help uh, decrease traffic congestion from commuting to the CBD as well as making transit an efficient and cost-effective option for people in the suburbs on the east side. All right, and I don't know if this, this might be the last one, but uh, Expo 86. So the 1986 World Exposition on Transportation and Communication was held by the province to commemorate uh, the city of Vancouver's centennial. Uh, its theme was selected out of realization that Vancouver's geography, although beautiful, also proves to be a challenge for urban transportation. So one thing really interesting was that um, Mayor Harcourt was elected on a campaign for responsible planning of the event, uh, fearing a financial disaster like uh, Montreal's 1976 Olympic Games. So Harcourt appointed a committee of aldermen and older women uh, to negotiate the immunity for the city from taking debt for the event, because it was envisioned that there would be a substantial debt. And this was negotiated with the province in exchange for exempting uh, you know, the current or the older uh, Canada Harbor Place which was actually uh, the Canada's pavilion for the exposition. So this was, uh, the city would exempt this uh, of them from future water, sewer, fire, and police protection charges uh, as a convention complex after the event. So there's a, a negotiation there. 
Um, so Expo 86 had a significant impact on tourism and immigration to BC and Vancouver later on. Uh, yet it also significantly impacted the low income rental housing stock as well as single room occupancy housing uh, in the eastern lands around False Creek during and after the event. Now, one of the most obvious legacies is the, a, uh, the, um, Science World, uh, the Science World building that we have today, which is a landmark, as well as you know, SkyTrain in itself a milestone, which serves as a compounded legacy for the exhibition's urban transportation aspirations and theme. And finally, um, it was argued that Expo 86 marked a rite of passage for, uh, into the world spotlight for many Vancouver residents. And one of the most important elements of this identity was the uh, affirmation for a more livable and transit-oriented city. Uh, now, you know, we've all talked about some of the issues that were most interesting to us, but that doesn't by any means uh, limit the importance of some of the other uh, milestones that occurred during this period. Uh, these were just a few that we had identified uh, either early on or very late in this process uh, that we wished we had time to uh, investigate uh, more, more in depth uh, or to flesh out as, as milestones. Um, you know, so uh, obviously, uh, as I mentioned to all of you at the beginning of this course, uh, I was, it was important to me to um, incorporate some um, subaltern or alternative uh, planning histories that would uh, resonate with people who aren't planning nerds uh, as, as we are. <laughs> um, but uh, so for instance the Shalimar townhouses in Dunbar which were non-conforming to the Dunbar plan, uh, the Downtown Eastside Residents Association um, and the, uh, the uh, work that they were doing at the end of this period uh, the 1972 elections and the story behind that and how those particular uh, politicians uh, played a role in advancing planning, uh, the evolution of BC Transit and the story of that bureaucracy, uh, the Vancouver Area Councils and their role in area planning and the uh, limited dividend rental program ending in 1975 which had uh, lasting impacts on affordable housing in this very day uh, because of the uh, curtailment of uh, new, new rental construction. Um, because of that very subtle policy change. So these might not be the kind of glitzy, uh, wonderful things that we want to present to you today, uh, but they are no less important, and uh, I think that they merit a further investigation uh, in the future. Um, so, you guys have anything else? Yeah. Thank you so much for your <laughs>